What if we made four changes to the way we teach programming? Students do programming not only outside class, but also in class. Teachers teach programming not by putting code in discussion, but discussion in code. Comments are used not to clarify code to reduce the need to read an experiment with it, but to create suspense and motivate the reading and experimentation of the code. And programming experiments are conducted not by a demonstrating instructor, but the students themselves. Then we argue that we can channel the user interface of a visual programming environment to formally teach programming details and create an interesting alternative to both recorded and live lectures. To understand the relationship between programming environments and teaching, let us consider the visualness of a programming environment. On the extreme left is the command line environment, which provides a single window that is unaware completely of the fact that there is code being manipulated. The middle is the web-based environment, which has two windows, both of which are partly aware of the fact that they are manipulating code. On the extreme right is an industrial strength visual environment with an arbitrary number of code aware windows, each of which provides sophisticated uh, commands. The classic argument for using a simple environment that it, it is easier to learn. The classic argument for a industrial strength visual environment is that it is consistent with project based learning, which says that students should be using the practices of the practitioners. And the practitioners use a visual environment because it's more intuitive and leads to better productivity. Here we're going to talk of another metric, the pedagogical value of a programming environment and argue that a visual programming environment offers the most uh, teaching value. Here's an example to show why. It involves assigning a double to an int variable. The simpler environments simply give you the error message um, without telling you how to fix it. The more sophisticated environment on the right, will, which, is, which, is, which, is our, uh, which is Eclipse, will, will give you the error in context, so it's more visual and intuitive. It also tells you the various ways in which the error can be, uh, can be fixed. So there is a pedagogical value there, but this learning occurs only if the student actually ran into this error and knew to hover over the error to see the alternatives. So this is opportunistic and informal learning. This is why currently an instructor must first formally teach a programming concept and then maybe the concept is reinforced through the programming environment. What we are arguing is that, that uh, the lecture may or may not occur and it is the exercise of the programming environment that's guaranteed to occur and that does, which does the formal teaching. So this approach is consistent with active learning because students are using the programming environment to learn and consistent with flipped classrooms, except that flipped classrooms expect the recorded lecture to be looked at at home. Here, even the recorded lecture is optional. So in the proposed model, we must somehow ensure learning supported by the programming environment. This can be done by giving students instructions that create the conditions that trigger such learning and ask students to reflect on their observations. And this in turn can be supported by giving students commented code with instructions and discussion. So in a traditional lecture, we put code in presentation, and this is a PowerPoint presentation. In this approach, we put presentation in code or discussion in code. Okay, so the code is the first class object. Now, there are multiple ways in which you can uh, comment the code uh, to trigger uh, learning. And one approach is to use a deductive approach where you first give the general explanation and then uh, ask students to answer questions on specific examples uh, that exercise the general concept. So in this case, we not only explain the, 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 ex the examples that take the form of code, that can be manipulated in the programming environment. The explanations take the form of comments. 
So the comments are used to both explain the code and the general concept. And then students are asked to answer certain questions and they can verify the answers to the questions by actually using the programming environment to either compile the program or to run the program. Okay. So this is the deductive approach. An alternative is to use the inductive approach. Again, we have certain code examples and questions that ask students to use the programming environment and their own thinking power to answer the questions. The programming environment verifies the answers they may have thought about. But this time, there is no comment explaining the general concept. Instead, the students are expected to derive the general concept, maybe by choosing from a bunch of alternatives that are given in the, um, in, in, in the, in, in the code. So this is the inductive approach where examples come first and based on the examples, the students come up with generalized explanations. So the purpose of the code is to motivate them to actually explore different alternatives to find the general explanations. And one way to explore alternatives is to comment and uncomment given code. And the exercise will tell them how to use uh, programming environment commands such as block comment and uncomment that allow such exploration. In this example, we use the programming environment to derive a concept related to the correctness of a correctness issue. Is, is this kind of code correct at compile time or runtime? In programming courses, we also teach software engineering principles that have to, that deal with style. And we can promote such learning also by creating appropriate examples. So here, the code has created two methods, print polymorphic and print non-polymorphic, one of which takes a class as a parameter and the other one takes an interface as a parameter. They are asked to supply various kinds of uh, values to these methods and asked to um, answer questions about which method takes a larger range of values as an argument. Based on that, they are asked uh, to, to determine which is more versatile. And from that, they are asked to derive general software engineering principles, such as, uh, such as using interfaces rather than classes as, as types of variables, and more important, associating classes with interfaces. So the goal here is for students to see code that has and does not, that does and does not promote software engineering principles to discover style rules. This approach can be coupled with the learning management system that formally grades the students and tells them the correct answer uh, to their questions, which is particularly important for the uh, questions that ask generalized, generalized explanations, as these explanations aren't uh, given by the programming environment. So we can now formally describe the what of this process. Students are given code with pedagogical instructions specific to a target programming environment that tells the students how to use specific commands in the environment uh, to, to do the exploration. And so this code enables exploration of desirable and undesirable specific code alternatives. And, and it teaches the, the students use of the P programming environment features to do this exploration and evaluate the desirability of various alternatives. And it poses questions to enable discovery of general concepts about form and function. And such code we call praxis code. And execution of this code involves the students using the target environment to manipulate the shared code as instructed. So this code is provided in a shared repository uh, from which they fetch it. And students can answer the questions in the comments in line in, the, um, in their code and also do it um, with the learning management system. So that's the what of this approach. Let's look at the why. Because these um, comments tell you how to use the programming environment features like block comment, uncomment, they make these features easier to learn, which in turn means the students will learn a la larger range of features, of programming environment features, which should increase their productivity. So this approach harnesses the power of visual programming environments. So we saw how 
two kinds of programming environment features contributed to two kinds of learning. Okay, so block commenting, uncommenting, and error reporting and fixes were used both to understand CAS and interface-based typing. What is the range of concepts that um, can be learned by uh, teaching new programming environment features? Interfaces are a, are a special case of the general idea of supertypes, um, which create is a relationship. So the type, type hierarchy displayed by a programming environment can be used to re, uh, teach these concepts and visualize them. When you have multiple types that form a hierarchy, then, then you create a bunch of related types uh, among which you might want to navigate. So the navigation commands in general and the show definition and references command in particular come in useful here. They also come in useful for any program that follows a design pattern, which involves multiple classes and multiple interfaces. The show definition command is particularly useful for teaching overloading because it tells you which of the various overloaded methods is, is referred to by a specific overloaded call. Overriding, on the other hand, requires dynamic execution. So here the debugging commands uh, come in handy where you can actually see what path uh, a, a particular piece of code takes. The variable display of a debugger can be used to show the hazard relationship and, and explain the general idea of a reference and how these references can be used to create trees, DAGs, and cycles. Okay. So that was the range of programming environment features that are explained as a side effect of explaining the concepts. What is the range of concepts that can be explained using uh, this approach? Well, text and code combined with the graphics generated by programming environments can be used to teach anything in theory. And, and this approach is actually used today by many instructors who teach by demonstrating programming. And practices are in this spirit, except that they formalize and make persistent the script that is or should be used by the demonstrator. And the big difference is that the driver of the experiment is the student now rather than the instructor. So hopefully the student learns more as a result. So we can use this approach to teach any concept. The question is, should we use this approach to explain all concepts or is it sufficient? And, and the drawback is that, or, or the limitation is that practices are useful only if the programming environment allows discovery of the alternatives and answers associated with an issue. So this approach isn't that useful for a proof or a real world analogy, which, which is something you can't experiment with in, in code in a, using a programming environment. So this means that you need supplemental lectures that are symbiotic. They don't compete with the content that the practices teach but they amplify that content. And to give, to illustrate, students can be given a traditional lecture that illustrates type checking using a car rental analogy. So if they've asked for a regular model, they would not object getting a deluxe model, but they would object in the reverse case. So this analogy or this traditional lecture can be, and this presentation can be complemented with actual praxis code that shows the types at work, type checking at work. So this idea was first conceived in fall of 2016 when I created praxis to teach all technical details of all concepts of our CS2 course at UNC called COM 401. The reaction was a bit mixed. Some students complained about the lack of big picture. So this semester I've added Supplemental live lectures for real-world analogies, graphics, and animations. Students seem to understand more in lectures as details are not discussed. And since this is an experimental approach, uh, students have access to traditional recorded lectures, which they've al always had, even when I was doing live lectures. So we can try to compare how effective the praxis approach is with live lectures by seeing how much students resort to watching the recordings. The more they watch the recordings, arguably the less effective 
uh, the mechanism is uh, that is used in plus. So uh, the question is, in which semester were recordings viewed more? Uh, here I'm comparing uh, the 2016 semester where I've, in which, which was completed and, and uh, the time before that when I last taught that, taught that course. And here we see YouTube, YouTube analytics and this is a very preliminary answer because it combines together the viewing of all videos that are, that are posted on YouTube. Uh, on the top is fall 2015 when I gave live lectures. On the bottom is fall 2016 when we use Praxis. They're using different scales. And if you look at the numbers on the right, you see that with live lectures, students resorted far more to watching the recorded lectures. And when they were Praxis, the traffic was uh, a little bit more than the traffic when I'm not teaching any course. And at that time, the traffic comes from outside my class from the general internet. So based on these data, at least, uh, the praxis seem an effective mechanism to teach. So this is a new idea and it raises more questions than, and, than provide answers. Um, there are many issues that one can explore in future work. I once heard a quote that said that you do not have to go to war to know that war is bad. So do you really need active learning, especially the kind supported by praxis, to learn a concept. Active learning is slower, so do you really get benefits of that slower pace? And people have argued that the slower pace results in more efficient assignments and exam preparation. And based on the YouTube statistics, that seems to be the case, but we need more investigation. Um, do praxis work for different kinds of courses? I, I used it for, I used them for CS2, what about CS1, or more advanced courses such as OS and distributed systems? And if, these, if, if the praxis work really well, uh, can this idea be used in other project-based learning? Can we teach writing by giving students samples of good and bad writing and ask them to explore and, 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 and make judgments on the various forms of writing and, and learn that way? Uh, so, uh, and, and we also need more prep experience with um, the CS2 praxis in general and the ones I developed. And if you want access to them, you can go to my webpage mentioned here.